We were dropping bombs. We were bombing from 30,000 feet, 35,000 feet. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill them, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down Frankfurt and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst we got children. Going to I could never not go back. They were my friends and they felt the trouble I She did say, you've changed. A soldier put everything on the line to help one of our blokes. Air Marshal David Evans, AC, DSO, AFC, served in the Royal Australian Air Force for 42 years. He signed up in 1943 during World War II but just missed out on getting into the action. Determined to serve, David had a variety of postings, including operational deployments in the Berlin Airlift and in the Vietnam War. He retired from the RAAF as the Chief of Air Staff, what we now call Chief of Air Force. This is his conversation with Thomas Kay in David's home in Canberra. I'm Thomas Kay and I'm joined today by Air Marshal David Evans. David, thank you for welcoming us into your home. My pleasure. I'm interested in what you're doing. I think it's a good thing, as much history as you can uh, gather. Thank you. Well, David, let's start with who was David Evans before signing up into the Armed Forces? (laughs) I was a young man that had finished school and I'd, well, I'd been waiting for the war to continue going because I joined the Air Training Corps when I was... I was just 15, and uh, the war started when I was 14. And my first thoughts, when uh, the young man was calling out at the, in the shopping centre, war declared, war declared, and my, I was with my mother. And uh, we went home, she gave him tuppence the paper, and he said, he'll have to go. She said, don't be ridiculous, he's only 14. At the same time, I did a sum, I thought, well, the other wars went for five years. I hope this one does. But I was thinking that to myself. My mother's view was very different. And she went away happily thinking it wouldn't last that long anyhow. And so uh, then when the Air Training Corps came along, which I think is a very good thing, I joined that, of course, and went there one or two nights a week and learned all about it. By the time I got to the initial training school, I'd covered it by the Air Training Corps, really. I knew the subjects and the things quite well, so that was a great help. Can you talk us through your training when you enlisted? Okay, well, for people were going in in large numbers. It's uh, it's quite incredible that the numbers were going in. And with, we had flying training, about six flying training schools, elementary flying training schools, and the same number of advanced flying training schools. So the training was that you went into academic size for three months and really uh, you were looked at pretty closely. Uh, if you weren't going to make it, you wouldn't get through that. But as I say, the Air Training Corps prepared people. That was three months. And then the big thing was what flying training school would you go to? They're all tiger moths where it was. I went to Narromine, I was sent there. The dreadful thing happened to me. The day before we were to, to go off to Narromine, we'd finished the, the uh, initial training school, I got chicken pox. <laughs> I was sent to hospital for, for two weeks. So I missed out on that course. And I went to Narromine when I got out of hospital, but of course the course had started and I had to wait till the next one. And then there was a delay. The course was delayed a month, so things were running out on me. But then I did uh, a flying course. We did about 65 hours on Tiger Moths. And after 10 hours, we were given a check. That was a frightening bit. The people were tossed off and that. You can't imagine the, the worry and, the, and not only me, everyone. Anyhow, I got through that. But every day, people were being uh, scrubbed, to use the term then used, and you'd find in a hut of 40 people, blokes were mostly about 18, and some blokes crying as they packed up to go. I mean, it was a, all right, it was hard to understand, but uh, we'd been, I'd been living for a few years for this, this event and so most of the others. And uh, in the end, 50% was scrubbed. Mostly it happened at initial training school uh, and about, I suppose, 
about 15%, 10 to 15% at advanced school. So anyhow, having got through the first one, that was the big deal. And then I went to Bundaberg. You never knew how you were going. You wanted you. You wouldn't. The worst thing that happened to me you used to do the push aeroplanes and hold wings and things when you're out at the flying school while you're waiting for your turn to fly. And I was wearing flying boots that we were issued with. You know, they looked good and they had black leather boots that folded over. And I had a, one of the instructors said to me, a sergeant pilot, the, the instructor, uh, he said, "You're an overconfident bugger, Evans." And I thought, oh, God, that's it. You know, he says, I'm overconfident. What chance have I got now? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I got through and uh, went to Bundaberg. A lot of fellows went to uh, Canada. Uh, and I went to Bundaberg to go. And I put in to go on to multi-engined aircraft because I'd learned early in my life on air power that bombers were the ones that, that won the war. They took the war to the enemy where fighters were, were defensive and you didn't win wars by being... I'd read enough on things to understand those things, and I did. I often look back, and I think I said to you earlier, someone to want to go to bomber plan wasn't thinking very far into the future, I guess. But anyhow, I didn't get to either. After graduating, where were you posted? This was a dreadful part. I, we, I was posted to Embarkation Depot in Victoria, and I thought, oh, this is fantastic. We, we'll be going overseas, uh, and, a, and a few of my mates. We got there, reported to the sports ground, and were told, oh, well, there's nothing for you. Uh, you don't have to stay here. You can stay in town or stay here. I stayed in town and went out every day, no posting. After about a month of this... I posted to Heidelberg, uh, a training ground in Melbourne. The sort of training we did was rifle drill, bayonet drill, throwing grenades. I thought it was a bit odd. Uh, I joined to go to war in an aeroplane. That course was, I think, to be about six weeks. I did two weeks. And fortunately, and I don't know why, I got a posting to Evans Head as a staff pilot at the School of Air Navigation at Evans Head. But the others kept going on the, on the course uh, and myself and two others got posted to Evans Head. Uh, how it came about, I don't know, but thank God it did. I mean, I was back flying and uh, and I kept flying jobs for, for the next 13 years. One way or another. So that was a bit of good luck. In early 44, the Brits said, oh, the 1,000 arriving aircrew arriving this month or graduating, we don't need them yet. Just uh, And then two months later they said... Uh, we're finished with it, it's over the course, uh, we don't need any more. Now, the Royal Australian Air Force had recruited people 12 months ahead. The pilot's course, navigators was 12 months, and these people had been recruited. The Air Force obviously didn't know what to do. They kept the training going in case it changed. And so we had an enormous number of people, pilots and navigators and air gunners. By the time we got to 1945, it was very difficult to get a posting at all. And while I didn't get to the war, I, I, got, I kept flying. I then, at Evans Head, I pestered the chief of flying to get me an operational posting. He said, well, what do you want to fly? And I said, bow fighters. He said, oh, I'll see what I can do. In the meantime, when you're not programmed to fly, get an aeroplane and you can go no fly because that's what to be doing in bow flying. He said, along the beach, not over the land, but along the beach, and that, that'll get you into that if you get on the boat. Well, I thought it was pretty good of him, which I did with great joy, but I got pasting to Bofords instead, which meant I had to do a general reconnaissance course because the Sanantis shipping was most of their work. And as I said, instead of taking, what, four weeks or so, six weeks, it, it took nearly three months. So by the time I was then got to East Sail to fly Bofords, we were there and uh, we had just about finished the course and the war ended. So we just about finished the course and getting posted to a squadron and I think I was going to a hundred squadron which was up at Moratai or somewhere. And with movies one night, the war's over, Japan has surrendered and everyone jumped up, they were hugging each other and cheering. Bugger. <laughs> <laughs> Not a, uh, a reaction I suppose to be proud of to the war end, but we were both <laughs> dreadfully disappointed. So that would happen. We were told uh, next morning that we'd be discharged. The course would finish, of course, and we would be uh, sent to where we joined the uh, joining up uh, place, where the mine was Bradfield Park in New South Wales, uh, within two weeks and, uh, and then be discharged. I thought that was dreadful. It's not what I wanted to do. 
So I went and saw the flight commander and said, look, I don't want to get out of the airfield, I want to stay in. He said, what, what a stupid thing to ask, you're being discharged. And I said, I said, all right, can I see the CO? He said, well, that's up to him if he'll see it, but he'll tell you the same as I did. Anyhow, he did see me, but kicked me out very quickly. So I thought, well, I'll go up to Air Force. Oh, he said, we do what Air Force headquarters tells us. So I thought, well, the only place to go is Air Force headquarters up in Victoria Barracks in Melbourne. So I went into town, didn't get any leave, because if I'd have asked for leave, I wouldn't have got it, or what they'd have said, what do you want it for? So anyhow, I got a train up there, wandered into this huge headquarters. I mean, we had an Air Force of 180,000, so it was a, had no idea where anything was. I'll have to ask officers because they'll be the only ones that knows where everything is. That was a big mistake. I should have asked sergeants or anyone else. But uh, anyhow, where where is the uh, the recruiting or where is the uh, posting part? And they tell me I eventually found it. And the corridors, these large buildings and offices on each side, there's nothing on the door. So I saw one with postings, flight lieutenant so and so postings, and went in there. And uh, yes, sir, what do you want? I said, oh, well, I told him what happened at sale and we were told we'd be in discharge and I wanted to stay in the Air Force. And he, he said, what do you want? I said, well, I'd like to stay in the Air Force and get a permanent commission. And he burst out up. He said, wouldn't we all? Look, we're here, we've got 180,000 in the Air Force and we've got to just get rid of most of those as quickly as we can. And you're coming in here? Is everyone going to come here and ask to stay? So that was that. Uh, and I thought, well, that's it. But what about discharge? If someone's got to discharge me, I'll go there. And so I found out where discharges were, wandered along the corridors in the same way, and I saw squadron leader Law Smith discharges. So I knocked on his door and went in and saluted. Yes, flight sergeant, or sergeant, what can we do for you? And I told him the same story. He said, well, I guess we want to man the Air Force with volunteers. Tell you what I'll do. I'll go and see if, if I can get a posting for you. I'll cancel your discharge. Came back in 20 minutes and said... How would you like to fly Dakotas? I said, well, anything at all, sir. That's fantastic. And uh, he said, all right, I'll scrub this charge. You'll be posted at 38 Squadron, fly Dakotas. Uh, and, of course, we all lined up and told, well, you knew what was happening. We've got your postings here now. And piled off to so-and-so to Bradfield Park for discharge, some, someone to Adelaide Recruiting Centre for discharge or going through them. Flight Sergeant Evans, 38 Squadron for flying duties. There was silence everywhere. The, the, the flight commander reading this was astounded and, and everyone turned around and, and it, then he went on reading the rest of them. And then at the end he said, all right, now go to the uh, boarding room and get your travel orders. And on the way out, he said, Evans, did you know anything about that? How could I, sir? <laughs> Okay, so talk us through your role in the number 38 Squadron and what you did there. Okay, 38 Squadron was a bit of a, an odd one at that stage because at the end of the war a lot of people were posted there. I mean, we had, I think, 13 squadron leaders and they were navigators. No, they weren't navigators, they were all pilots or maintenance officers. Anyhow, I expected I'd be given a course taken out, uh, you know, this is Dakota, and I'd be, be taught to fly it. Nothing happened. There was a board with the names of all the pilots, our uh, captains, co-pilots on the board, navigators, and it went up as trips came up, you just went out as where you were on the board. And I got an aeroplane on the... So I got a mate to take me down and sit in the Dakota, but there wasn't much he could tell me. He was a co-pilot, he didn't get much work to do. And uh, he told me how to raise the undercarriage and put flaps down and the things I'd be asked to do as co-pilot. But that was it. And I went on my first trip. had no idea about flying the aircraft. And I sat there. I thought I'd be useful and I kept a navigation log. And uh, the pilots, the captains were, in my view at that time, all the old blokes. You know, they'd have been 30 and <laughs> highly aged blokes. Anyhow, I was there and keeping the slot, think I was doing a good job. And he said... Uh, what are you doing with that, uh, lad? I said, I'm keeping it locked, sir. He said, had a look at it. He said, yeah. He said, look, open the window and throw that out. Well, I, I know all that. I know where we are. You don't need to worry about it. That. So I sat there doing little. And I went, I suppose, for 12 months without being given a landing. So I just sat there, as all co-pilots did that time. And then I, some bloke gave me a landing and he obviously not very happy about my landing. It wasn't very good, but I hadn't done a landing in anything before uh, at all. And uh, Anyhow, uh, that's how 
was. And uh, then I thought, well, I've got to do something to do something that's better. So I kept the engine readings during the climb, which you're supposed to do, or someone said it used to be done or something like that. So I did them again. Then I worked out how much freight we had on, how much was going off the next stop, and how much we'd be able to take on there, where to, how much fuel we'd need. These things always happened when the aircraft landed and the captain went up to the air movement centre and they'd sit down and work these things out. So I used to do it on the way and we'd send that off to impress the captains and then uh, while they were up there I'd hop up in the wing and do the refuelling, drain the tanks so there's no water in the fuel and it was all ready when they got back to go. So I got to the stage where a couple of captains were... Sounds awful to say this, but they were arguing who was going to have me as a, as a co-pilot because I did all this work. Anyhow, I went with one was, he was a bad example of how to be a captain. I'll tell you, his flying was not bad flying, but uh, it wasn't always. He went low flying when he thought he could and uh, did manner of things. But then I uh, went with a fellow called Somerville, who was a flight commander, and he then said, it's time we checked you out, and he checked me out ending up with two trips with him from Schofield to Japan, in which I flew every second leg. And when we got back from the second trip, I was captain. But by that stage, I had been with the, with the squadron for a year. So I was pretty slow going. But there were still flight lieutenants and squadron leaders, co-pilots in the squadron. So I was uh, something of a, a unique sort of bloke as a warrant officer by that stage and, and captain, which... That went on all right, so I was commissioned about oh, about a year later, I guess, in, into the squadron. And then, of course, we went, the Berlin airlift came along and we went on that. But that was great from a flying point of view, but uh, I've been that lady that's in the next room I'd met before. And uh, at this stage, we'd, I'd been going with her for over a year. And, we'd, and about the 21st of June, we were told... Uh, the squadron, or the names read out of the pilots and navigators, going to uh, to Germany for the Berlin airlift on the 29th. Oh, God. <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, I went down, we told that on a Friday, and I uh, went down to Sydney, spoke to Gail, and we discussed this and decided, well, we were going to get married next Saturday. It could be done in before. So we decided... Yes, we did, got married, which was a curious thing to do. The CO was told what I was doing because Qantas couldn't take us all in one go, so I was taking it on Wednesday and Saturday. And anyhow, when the CO was told I was getting married, I'm told, he threw his pencil down, he said, the silly bugger, what do you think he's doing? Well, he at least said I could go on the last trip. We got married on the Tuesday, I think. And we, I left on the Saturday night. But the serious thing, looking back on that, you know, that would never happen today. No one would dream of sending anyone uh, that was getting married next week, nor would anyone, uh, you know, but people would expect it. Now, the media would go mad, you can't do that to treat people like that. But our thinking, I mean, the war hadn't been over that long and people were sent away. I mean, I know lots of Air Force people and a couple of them were on the ill of people who were going with me. Had been overseas five years, but overseas uh, in, in UK for five years. If they were married, and no one ever would dream of arguing about it. And nor did we. I mean, that's happened. I was in the Air Force, and they said, you're going to Germany. Gail understood that. But we didn't like it, but that's how it was. I said at the time, we were being, oh, I don't know. We, we all thought it would, this, is some, this blockade would be something last a few weeks. But I said to Gail, we'll be home in a couple of months. It was 14 months. The Russians, in the first place, they wanted... The discussion had taken place in the UK between the, the Allies and the with the Russians of who would occupy various parts of Germany. Uh, and there was a lot of argument about that. The Brits were mainly interested in getting into the industrial areas for the thinking of their own uh, industries. So they were happy, and the Americans wanted coastal areas on the Baltic, and the uh, Russians have got a huge part, of course, including our coverage of Berlin. 
Now, the occupation forces, the Russians ran it as, uh, as a dictatorship, really, uh, uh, totally under control, whereas democracy meant the American and British and French uh, military commanders uh, were more human. They c complained us. The Russians were complaining and had written a letter to the commanders, and the American commander, I've forgotten his name for the moment, he wrote back to the uh, chief of the army in America and said, they're putting, the Russians are putting such, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, restrictions on in a way. We can, uh, they want to uh, examine our trains, go through what we're taking in each day to Berlin uh, and uh, what personnel have got to have special uh, permits. He said, this is, uh, we don't accept that. We can't accept that. I believe if we do so, it'll just be the first of actions to keep us right out of Berlin anyhow. The Russians did that. They just closed all the roads and uh, railways going into Berlin for maintenance purposes, which meant we couldn't go in. We had uh, uh, battalions in there, each, each uh, country, uh, and they couldn't support them. In the Allied parts of Berlin, the Germans were dependent on, on the uh, occupying powers to see that they got food, medical supplies and all those, uh, and they would have had to get out. The discussion was, do we go to war or accept that? And then the idea of doing it by air was put forward. Many people thought it wouldn't work. A city of two million people, or the, the parts under Allied control of two million people, to be supplied by air. With the weather that's uh, around in Germany in winter, it'll fail, and then where will we be? Anyhow, the decision was made, yes, we'll do it. The American governor, military governor, went to America, spoke to the president and told him we should do the airlift. The president gave 75 C-54s to add to the what was in, available in Germany and it went on. And it's, it's simple, isn't it? It succeeded. We flew in all sorts of conditions that you wouldn't... Even today, civil aeroplanes wouldn't fly in the conditions. You know, I'd fly for a week and never see the ground above 400 feet. Odd sort of things, a lot of icing that we weren't used to. I mean, I'd been flying to Japan and most of our people from Sydney to Japan, we went through some pretty bad weather at times, but this was low cloud and sleet, poor visibility. And we got used to it. I mean, we didn't, I think, the Americans lost a number of aeroplanes and the Brits some. We didn't bend an aeroplane. We were very fortunate. But it was. Flying conditions you normally wouldn't fly in became the norm uh, and we cleared for it. Uh, and it succeeded. We were started off in the first few days. It was very Virtually not enough to keep a you know, few families going. But within a month, they were getting a fair amount in. And the last, I think, 1,250 tonnes a day were going in by rail. And at the end, uh, the airlift commander sent in, I think, 1,200 missions. And we flew, we flew over 1,250 what had been going in by train. And this found that we could continue doing that as long as it was necessary. Hell of an effort, but nevertheless. And the Russians could see this too, and then they uh, they called it off. We were kept there. The Brits were changing because they had lots of squadrons in the UK. They'd come and do a month or two in the airlift and go back. Another squadron would come. The uh, South Africans were changed over at the end of six months. Even the New Zealanders were changed over. But we were left there. No word of what was happening to us. And it was becoming, you know, after six months and on, it was becoming annoying. Everyone was, except a few single blokes we had, uh, they were quite happy to be there and stay there forever, but uh, most of the people want to get home. And we couldn't find anything out from Air Force headquarters, not a thing what was going to happen to us. And the worst part of that, when the airlift finished, I think in May, or the Russians opened the thing and said the airlift, uh, the Brits said, and the Americans, look, we can't uh, believe this lot. We better keep it going till we build up three months' supply in Berlin. So as they bring it on again, uh, we've got plenty of time to reintroduce the airlift. We were kept there, the Australians, for that extra few months. Now, why in God's name couldn't it have been the Brits done it? Why couldn't we have been sent home? Looking back, and I still and I often tell the story to any young Air Force people today, that we were treated... Very badly. I mean, no one concerned about us all. So that's what happened. Uh, and we flew home.
And then on one occasion while you were flying, you and your crew discovered that there are what you thought were some unnecessary <laughs> items being yeah, flown in. I yeah. did. We <laughs> saw it along the side of the condom, boxes of condoms. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. It was snowing and bloody miserable weather. It was soaking wet and cold going out to the airport to get aboard. So this is what I'm getting out of bed for. Anyhow, on the way down, I better... Character came to the poor, and I thought, oh, well, good luck to the poor buggers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what else? Well, we had the day that uh, I lost an engine failure on takeoff, uh, about 100 feet, and uh, 100, 200 feet. Uh, had 23 passengers aboard, and the engine just failed. 23 passengers were kids, 10 and 12, uh, with names around their neck of who they were and where they were going. It was a cool day, and the air was dense, and it was flying all right on one engine, and I managed to climb up to, I've forgotten now, I think it's about 600 feet or something like that, and do a circuit and come in and land. So there was no problem, it all worked very well. I got an entry in my logbook saying that was pretty good. Well, jumping ahead to when you were back in Australia doing some training, you served in capacity for the next four years over with the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Yes. And when you um, departed in New Zealand, you received word that you were about to be posted overseas. Yes, that I was going, well, career was on. Yes, and, and yes. that didn't eventuate. No, again, I just decided oh, if you want to stop a war, post David Evans to it. <laughs> again, another disappointment going on. Was, and, and I was posted back to the transport uh, squadron. And then I was in the, uh, the VIP Used for VIP flying that because I'd flown the Dakota a lot of time and had a lot of flying hours. So, and then I was a flying instructor for the squadron and I did some VIP work and not instructing. That was bad. I was getting plenty of flying. Oh, yes, the Queen's visit, of course, came along. And as a flying instructor, I was to uh, look after the crews of this Queen's flight, see that, for instance, the captain flying the Queen and the one that was stand by that their instrument rating was up and kept up to date so as we traveled around the country i made myself unpopular by being required to give them some instrument flying or night flying things but nevertheless it, it lasted a while again that didn't please my wife very much she was left uh, in sydney and we went for about 12 weeks we were away a hell of a lot of time uh, it wasn't popular but it was an interesting trip for me I went to Staff College down at Point Cook. The Staff College was based on the Royal Air Force Staff College. And it was hard work, really. It was, uh, at the end of it, I think it, I'd, I said, I don't think anyone enjoys doing staff course, but I'm pleased I did it. But, uh, yeah, really, it was quite good. A lot to learn. I've been sitting in a cockpit for years and I uh, hadn't really done examinations or long, long uh, tasks. At the end of it, it was a posting wanted someone to be posted as staff officer to the Minister for Air. Uh, and three of us of the staff force went for an interview with the Chief of Personnel. Then I was sent up for the Minister to have a look at to see whether I was acceptable. So I spent a year, two years with him. That was an interesting one. It was very interesting, really, because... I read all the stuff from headquarters coming to the minister. So, really, so I knew more about what was going on in the Air Force than a lot of people in it, the serious stuff. Uh, minister asked lots of questions. He wasn't a bad bloke. He was a, a nervous minister. He didn't think his, the prime minister liked him and he kept thinking he was going to lose his portfolio, which he did eventually. Uh, but, I mean, he'd say to me, I don't think the prime minister likes me, David. Uh, I don't... Uh. Or if an aeroplane came up, for instance, prime minister wanted the VOP aircraft and there wasn't one available. He said, well, David, I can't tell the prime minister that. I, I said, well, there's none available, sir. I think I'd better hire a, a TAA aircraft. I said, I think the Prime Minister would be a bit annoyed about that, sir, if the media got onto it, uh, which they would. He said, oh, yeah, I, I said, you could ask him. Anyhow, well, he didn't do it. And things like that he, he was nervous about, but quite a nice fellow, really. Felt sorry for him. He was a lawyer uh, by trade. And so I spent two years with him. As I say, I saw everything going on. Interesting things to me is, for instance, when uh, the Indonesians or the Dutch wanted us to uh, stay in New Guinea and not give any to the Indonesians, 
They said, oh, well, you've got to call the other islands, but New Guinea's got nothing to do with you. And they were insisting on it. The Dutch came to our government and asked us, would we fight the Indonesians and say, no, you're not, we'll join with the Dutch and, and you'll have to fight for it. And our cabinet said, no, they wouldn't do that. But they were the sort of things I could read and I was interested in. From 1960 to 1962, you served as flight commander in Number 2 Squadron. What took place here? So you sent over to Malaysia? Yeah, I was, uh, which was good. Um, I was posted, I wanted to go to bombers, because remember I'd been in a bomber when the war ended in the Beaufort, and uh, I always thought that was a part of the Air Force with the offensive capability that I wanted to be in. So the minister pretty well said to me at the end of my two years, where would you like to go, David? Would you like to do a, uh, would you like to do a test pilot's course? No, test pilots, they come back, spend their time test piloting and instead of being an operational squadron said, for air power. So I said, no, I'd like to get back to bombers. So he um, said to the Air Force, you know, it's reasonable if you gave uh, David Evans a posting to bombers, which they did. So I went to uh, to Amberley, to Canberra, uh, and this was, what, 1959. And so I hadn't been on bombers really at all since the war. We were dropping bombs. We were bombing from 30,000 feet, 35,000 feet, and dropping bombs 100 yards away from target. And I said, this is ridiculous. I mean, 100 yards, but the bomber blokes who'd been there for years flying cameras, that's as good as you can do, sir. The the system, that's the best you can do. You get a 100-yard bomb, it's it's a good bomb. any good bomb, but it's 100 yards away, whether it's good or bad, it's it's not much use. Think of the sort of uh, weight of effort you've got to get to destroy a target. I said, you must be able to do better than that. Anyhow, they assured me I couldn't. This was the OCE. They were teaching me. I was not there to teach them. So then I was posted to Butterworth, and uh, we were in CETO, ex, uh, CETO Union, apart from ANZUS with the Americans, we were in CETO with Southeast Asia Treaty Organisation, and we worked with Thai and the Indians, as well as the Americans and Brits. And I noticed after an exercise in Thailand, one of our targets we had assigned, if war should start it, the two squadron had assigned, it was a bridge. But to get to it, you went past or close to two uh, Chinese um, fighter squadron, a uh, squadron. Race. So I thought the chance of getting through there are pretty remote. And then I looked at, with our accuracy, it was going to take something like 23 sorties to get rid of the bridge. And I reckon we'd have lost 23 aeroplanes in, in that sort of time, the number of sorties you'd have to do. So then I looked, what can we do to, to improve it? We've got to be able to bomb better than this. We've got to be able to... I remember saying to the crew room, well, we've got to be able to get 50 yards bombing distance. Oh, it's not possible, sir. The system, you can't do it. Anyhow, we did. We we couldn't do it from 30,000 feet, of course. The first things we tried, we came up with the idea they always wanted to go on with the 35,000 feet bombing at night. So you go at night, you haven't got as much danger from fighters. You would now, of course, but you didn't then. So I formed a, a dive bombing crowd, four crews, myself leading it, and we would go out to a point, say at high level, 15 miles from the, from the target, and then we'd go down to 3,000 feet. We, instead of having bombs, we carried coloured flares, and we'd stay at that position. As the, the bomber stream came, three minutes to pass each aircraft, I would go in and drop flares at 3,000 feet, pull up dive bomb and drop a, a green flare or something. And then I would call to the bomber stream coming in, Aim for my more well, 50 yards to the left of my green flare, and and that's how it went. they'd come in and bomb that. And the other three members were there standing by in case we needed more to come in and do that. So that worked pretty well, except uh, it only meant that they knew where the target was and where they should arm. Otherwise, at night they had no hope. Uh, and this was, I think, going back to World War Two, where the bomber command uh, master bomber used to go in and, and mark the target. So that worked quite well, except they could identify the target. It didn't mean they were any more accurate bombing the thing. I start to say, well, we've got to be able to do better than this and came up with my squadron, or not my squadron, but the squadron I was in. We would do it by day. We were better off to do it by day, going very low level and keeping under the radar on the way in, and then we would all bomb from 
from the uh, identification point 10 kilometres or 10 miles from the target, we could be very low when we got there and we'd go towards the target and pull up about 30 seconds before target and bomb from 10,000 feet. Our accuracy came good. We were doing very well. We were getting our 50-yard bombs. Obviously, it came the way we would operate in war. When I got to Vietnam, it was pretty obvious. First, we were doing a lot of night flying, bombing from under radar control. The radar would tell the aircraft, you know, left, left, steady, the speed, really bombs away, and you press the button and bombs go off. That was reasonable results, but not good enough. Anyhow, we wanted to do daylight trips, which we got put on that, uh, and we were quite accurate but looking at we had a lot of 500 pound bombs uh, and 1000 pound bombs to start with they were all bits bombs left over from world war ii this must be your first combat assignment which was heading off to vietnam yes what took place this must have been like full of excitement for you for not seeing combat in oh yes indeed 24 years of service yes it was yeah and i uh, desperately wanted to go there in fact well when we were in america I was there and we were in Vietnam, two squadrons was in Vietnam. Came home from America and, and the squadron had gone to Malaysia, two squadron, I think in 64, 65, 65. And uh, so I was coming back from America in, in uh, 67 and I wrote to the chief of personnel and asked could I be posted to two squadron. And he came back and said, no, uh, you're being posted to 33 squadron in Hercules. So that was disappointing again. And then I was at a restaurant having lunch one day and I saw an American reading the paper and the, the headlines on the paper so I could read was uh, Ambush Hits Boomerang. And it went, said that there, it was a story about the Australians that, uh, that had uh, been ambushed and they ended up killing a couple of hundred uh, Vietnamese. It's a well-known battle, army battle in, in Vietnam. We killed about 250 although there were only one battalion of us. We lost 14 or 15 blokes killed. But uh, it was a, a wonderful little action. Anyhow, with that, I sent him a co- I took cut that piece out of the paper, the American paper, and sent it off to Chief of Personnel and said, you know, it's interesting. It was once said that one volunteer man was worth a dozen press men. Can I still go to two squadron? <laughs> He changed his mind and posted me to two squadron. So that was a success. So I got back, we came back to Australia. I went to Ambly and did a conversion to the um, Canberra and went up there and then we got on to getting the bombing ranges down. So we were getting very good. We were getting the best bombing results in Unit Baron. We had a number of uh, American squadrons. One was the B-57 squadron, same aircraft. The Americans had made it, given it another name. And then there were a number of fighter squadrons all doing the same thing. Our accuracy of bombing was very good. And I think out of, we did 4% of the the missions out of Fan Rang and got 16% of the bombing damage assessments that we didn't make, they were made by the Americans which was said a lot for our bombing uh, accuracy, and uh, that was very pleasing. We were, you know, the squadron did a good job. We were the only squadrons that bombed at level. The, all the other bombing was done on dive bombing by Americans, which meant if the cloud base was 3,000 feet, they couldn't bomb because they needed to bomb, dive bomb from 5,000 feet, and uh, we could go in at, down to 1,000 feet if necessary. So we got a lot of targets that couldn't be got otherwise. Although sometimes they had B-52s flying from Guam coming down there and they carried, where I carried eight bombs, they carried 104. So it was very off-putting sometimes to have them bombing with you. (laughs) And you think, God, 104 come out of the B-52 and there were three of them usually in a row. You can imagine what that looked like, 312 bombs. And here I've got a lousy eight. (laughs) Nevertheless. The Canberra bombers of No. 2 Squadron flew under the command of the US 35th Tactical Fighter Wing, operating out of Phang Rang in Vietnam. They would fly medium-altitude missions against Viet Cong forces. Wing Commander David Evans was eager for this combat role, having never fired a shot in anger after 24 years of service. He knew Vietnam would likely be his last chance. 
David took charge of the Canberras when, following their bomb aiming methods honed in Malaysia, they achieved a circular error probability, or CEP, of 50 metres. David's intensive post-mission analysis helped refine their technique, and he permitted his pilots to bomb at the lowest altitude level possible at which the bomb site would operate. Unofficially, they would often go lower than this. The CEP was eventually reduced to 20 metres, making the Canberras, specifically the Australians, the most accurate bombing force in the region. By the end of his time in Vietnam, David was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for his performance as the commanding officer of Number 2 Squadron. Back to David's conversation with Tom. After coming back, did you feel fulfilled actually finally going out and finally seeing combat? I felt pleased with myself that I didn't have any concerns or worries or fear and uh, we did a good job. However, I was very much aware of the fact that the Americans were ignoring almost every principle of war. Really, there are ten principles of war and as the aim, you must know what you're going to war for. We haven't known what we're going to war exactly for since 1945. That's true, and we haven't won a war since 1945. I mean, what was our aim in being in Vietnam? No one quite knew. I mean, the American president had made the, uh, made the statement that we're not here to win a war. We're not out to win a war. We're just we're protecting sovereign property. Well, that, boy, that must have meant a hell of a lot to the North Vietnamese who we were fighting. With. They are not trying to win a war. Hell, you know, what are you going to war first? And there are other things. The way we, we operate the bombers and... You just go through the principles of war and that was up. And I, this was on my mind and I thought when I get back, I wonder are the principles of war still still valid? I mean, they've been around for a long time and the Americans have them, the same as ours, most of the British dominions do. French have their own. Uh, when I get back, I'll look into it, which I did. When I got back, I was in the, uh, as a planner and I had um, uh, a number of people under Trial, and we did a study on the principles of war and came up with the fact that they are still very valid. And I put that review to the chiefs of staff and they accepted it. Yes, it's, they are valid, we should keep them. So, uh, but I've noticed the war since, you see, the cardinal principle of war is the aim. Why are we going to war? And if you can think of an aim the Americans have given us for any of the wars in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, they haven't known specifically what they were out to do. In the end, after years, they've done it in each case, they'll say, oh, we're training the, the Afghans, they'll be able to take over from us and, and do this now, we've taught them, and it doesn't happen, of course, that is every time. But we've been to war without a name, even the first Iraq war, where we went to do it to uh, stop the Iraqis going, or Saddam going into... Uh, Kuwait. All right, we stopped them going into Kuwait, but then when it ended, when they were retreating from uh, Kuwait and getting out, the Americans still didn't know what they were doing. Colin Powell rang up Storm and Norman and said, uh, Norman, the president's thinking we should, time we ended this thing, you know, they're getting out now. What do you think? He said, yeah, I think so. It's a bit of a turkey shoot. Yeah, we could, uh, we could end it now. And he said, all right, what, what about seven o'clock tomorrow morning, cease fire? OK. And he goes, Storm and all goes back to his staff and tell them, and then they get, he gets another phone call. Hey, the president thinks nine o'clock would be a better time. That would make it a hundred-hour war. You know, it's a good good finish, a hundred-hour war. OK, so they decided to keep going for another two hours. But they didn't plan what they were going to stop the uh, Iraqis taking out. He was allowed to take his artillery, his helicopters, and that if you read the, the meeting they had with, with the Iraqis uh, on conditions, you'd almost think the Iraqis were were winning the war because they said, well, we need to keep our helicopters for this and it was, they were allowed to do all sorts of things. So the Americans, they firstly had to decide, will we stop here or go on to, into uh, Agdab? We, we, we finish them off. They didn't know until the, the war was ending. It was, again, principles of war hadn't been sorted out. The aim hadn't been given. Following on from this coming back, could you tell us briefly leading up to your posting as the Air Marshal? 
as the air marshal officer. A long time I came back in 69, and it was not nearly 10 years before I became an air marshal. But I was in, I came back and I went to the Canberra and I was director of planning. Did that for, for a couple of years and I went to uh, director general of planning. And from there, I was posted to defence to the Director General of Joint Planning. Lots of time in the planning business from their appointed Chief of Air Force. It was a good job over there in plans. Uh, the best military officer I think I've known in my career was Admiral Sinnott. He was Chief of Defence Force then. He um, was excellent and uh, we got on very well. We had, I mean, he gave me a lot of authority as um, Director of Joint Plans. A couple of incidents. One, we were having our annual exercise, which is three f- forces, the uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force ha- having a thing. And then one with the Americans and Allies and the Brits. In. Uh, but in one of the local ones, the Australian ones, I said when I was organising the Joint Force, Army were going to have their strike force their, uh, and the enemy and their defending force. And there was the force exercise, operational exercise. And then um, he said, well, yes, well, of course, we need another headquarters. We always have a divisional headquarters. I said, what do you need a divisional headquarters? I mean, one headquarters lot, another 150 blokes as a divisional headquarters. What are they for? But we always do that. And I said, well, well, let's do it this time without one. Well, God, we can't do that. I said, we'll have to do it. You know, I'm exercise director. We in dictatorial bugger at the time. We'll do it. And I said, exercise was for this. He said, oh, I don't know, the chief of army. I think anyhow, I saw Tony Sinnott and told him what I'd done. He, he said, yeah, that's fair enough. And then the next one was with the uh, American exercise, RIMPAC or whatever we call them now, uh, where the fleet comes out and, um, and it's a full American one. And they were always went ashore in North Queensland. And the big deal of the thing was that everyone would go up, ministers and all sorts of people, to watch the fleet come ashore at four knots. So when I was running, I thought, this, this can't be the big deal. So I made the big thing, it was a parachute drop in land and the tax on an aircraft, uh, on an airfield and capturing it. And everyone sat up and watched that. It was entertaining, if nothing else, but it was. It was different. And uh, But then the American fleet commander said the Americans remained under his command till they hit shore and then they'll transfer to uh, Chief of Defence Force. I said, no, they won't transfer to Chief of Defence Force. There's, a, there's an operational commander who's defending this a man has an operational command, he's out there to defend Australia and fight war. It's, it's not for the Chief of Defence Force. And they came back and said, no, it's got to be the Chief of Defence Force. This is, these are lessons we've learnt in blood. <laughs> so I thought, bugger it, it's ridiculous. I mean, Chief of Defence Force is in, in Canberra and, uh, and that's his job to see that the exercise is run properly, but he's not commanding anything. He doesn't want the command of the American forces. So I said, uh, no, you'll go to the operational commander. And they said, oh, no, we don't do that. We might have to pull out of this uh, this exercise, which is going to say, I said, oh, God, imagine the the politics of this. So I thought, I'd better sell Sandy Sinnott. So I went back and told him what I'd done. Of course, I answered that, and they said, we'll have to pull out. And I said, oh, so be it. And I said, oh, <laughs> This is going to cause a stir. Anyhow, Tony Sinnott once again said, well, do it your way. And they didn't pull out with the exercise. Following on with your promotion as Air Vice Marshal, you became the Chief of Air Force Operations, which you held for two years. Yes. And then you were then appointed as an officer of the Order of Australia. How did it feel getting that? Oh, that, uh, I mean, it was nice, yes. I, I got, it's a compliment, I, I guess, what I can say. But... Uh, of course I was happy to have it and get it there. But I don't, for instance, look upon it with the same feeling of pride that I look upon my DSO. What well, one's done in combat and the other one's uh, being good staff officer, it's a big difference in a way. But nevertheless, yes, of course, I didn't say no. Then you left the Australian Air Force, uh, Royal Australian Air Force, and what happened then? What was your career afterwards, life after? Oh, I, my first things I did was being... A, a defence advisor to companies like um, British Aerospace uh, with them, advising them. It's a very careful thing that you can't uh, 
you've got to put the air force, what the I was there to tell them what the air force I thought the reaction would be, not to tell the air force what they should buy from British Aerospace, and that's the role I I saw as played. But I I didn't go. I said I would not go into uh, the defence officers to talk to staff officers at all. I would talk to the chiefs, but I wouldn't be going in there peddling the company. I don't suppose they liked it that much, but they accepted it, uh, and I stayed with them for some time. I got a call from the minister saying he'd like to talk to me about a, a job as, with the National Capital Authority. So he said he'd come and see me. And I said, well, if ministers as busy as I think they should be, I'd better come and see you because I'm not doing that much. So I went and saw him. And he said, uh, offered me the job as chairman of the National Capital Authority, which I thought was rather odd. What the hell did I know about uh, planning of cities and things? But also I accepted it. Uh, it's amazing. I went very well. I had, what, how many, seven years in that. I enjoyed it. I think I did a, a good job. I got a, a more practical view. It was run by architects. For instance, just to give you one example, I had, think I had 16 architects in the National Capital Authority, but everything we wanted done, they'd write a thing of uh, description of what the job that needed to be done and put it out for competition. I said, why aren't, why aren't you architects doing something like this? Can't you do some of these things? Oh, right, I suppose we could, but, but this is the way we are. Well, let's change it. Things like that were coming up. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed the job and then I sacked the chief executive. He was hopeless, truly. I mean, he couldn't make a decision and always the uh, NCO was being criticised in the media regularly for not responding to something, you know, taking months to get an answer out of people who wanted to do a job, uh, kept waiting. I brought in that anything that came in had to be given an answer within two weeks, even if it was only an acknowledgement, but they had to be given an answer within a month. And that worked pretty well. Things like that. Uh, so I ended up enjoying that job and I did for seven years. We, I think we stopped being criticised the way we were before and I went and talked to the housing people and the uh, the, all the building people around the Canberra, I got to know them. Yeah, yeah, I quite enjoyed that job. So in 2009, you retired. Yeah. And looking back on your life as that 14-year-old who was in the <laughs> shops with your mum deciding, you know, I want to do that, I want to go to the war, would you have made the same choices along the way if you had your life over? Oh, yes, yes, I would. I often say well, these days in my Old age, I give or such as my 90th birthday, and I had a number of Air Force people there, a few ex chiefs. I said, I look back on my life and think of the things I might have been. And I, I look at anything, whether I would have been good at it or could do it, but from a solicitor or a professional thing or a plumber, uh, all the things I could do, there was nothing I would have wanted more than to be a pilot in the Royal Australian Air Force. Well, David, thank you for welcoming us into your home and joining us on this podcast. OK, well, it's nice to talk to you. David Evans has authored several books. A Fatal Rivalry, Australia's Defence at Risk, War, A Matter of Principles, and his autobiography, Down to Earth. For a vivid account of wartime experiences flying Canberra bombers with their bombing tactics implemented by David Evans leaving a lasting legacy on their accuracy, go back to Season 1 and listen to Number 12, Ron Aitken. It's a fascinating conversation with a Vietnam Air Force veteran. To find out more about this podcast, visit www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at LOTLpod. Like us on Facebook at Life on the Line Podcast and follow us on Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening. And lest we forget. <laughs>